So today, you know, I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about really my deep passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. And I'm blessed to be able to work at the American Association for Advancement of Science, where we are running a program called Sea Change, which is really dedicated to making DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, normative within STEM. This program is very exciting, and I'm happy to be able to talk to you about it today and to be able to walk through, really, you know, why diversity matters, why it's important to the STEM in general, why we need systemic change to realize the changes that we want to see in the STEM workforce and the STEM education pipeline and more broadly, and kind of how we've adopted what are called the equality charters to create sea change and the implication it has not only for our work at AAAS and for higher education in general, but more specifically what other federal agencies and groups can be doing to create systemic change and potentially support sea change in particular. All right. So I want to start with why diversity matters, but before we do that, can we all just check that our phones are actually turned to silent or vibrate? There's always one in the crowd, and we don't want to be that one. Um, and one other thing I do want to check while you're kind of looking to make sure that's the case is who I'm speaking with today. Um, so who here, just by a raise of hands, is from ONR? Ah, uh, almost everyone. From other parts of the Navy? All right. Is anyone here from the other military branches? And do we have friends from other federal agencies? All right, NSF, NIH, NASA, what is it? DOD. DOD, I was getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw we have some fellows here from the Science Technology Policy Fellowship Program at AAAS. That's fantastic, as well, one of our uh, really more notable and well-known programs. Um, so that's really helpful, and you know, I really do want to start with why diversity is important. And it's critical that we keep having these conversations because oftentimes we run into people in the STEM disciplines, in STEM fields, at universities, who think that DEI is antithetical to the idea that STEM and STEM disciplines are a meritocracy where individuals rise to the top based on their own individual abilities or inherent skills and that the cream eventually rises. And we know this isn't true, and part of the problem is the culture and climate of STEM that has been created due to those types of beliefs, where there are biases, there's discrimination, and there are cultures that are abrasive to different individuals and to different groups of people. And so what is important is we need to th be thinking about why diversity matters and how to convince others that diversity matters. And before you know, I get too deep into my ramblings, I'd love for you just to take a few, one minute and turn to the individual next to you and ask them and hear from them about why they believe diversity in STEM is important, and then let them tell you as well. And then we'll come back together. All right, so just take two minutes here. <laughs> Yeah, it's important to have all different kinds of like 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 that was quick. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Cutting you short, but let's let's come back together. Um, I'd love to hear from maybe two or three folks about what they discussed or what they said. Are there any volunteers to share what they were talking about? Anyone? Any brave souls? Yes. Um, 
volunteer that no microphone i'll, I'll use my loud voice um microphone right here i got one all right thank you and we're um we're recording so we want all questions to come through the microphones please all right thank you uh good morning everyone so my partner here um i think i did all the talking we didn't he didn't get a chance to do that <laughs> Um, I'm Tanya Clark. I'm a part of ONR Global. Um, so, uh, start the conversation with I think it's important that we define what diversity means to you and what it means to me so we can come to some level uh, understanding. Um, I used your picture as a great depiction of what diversity is. It's a bunch of different people. Um, and different places and different cultures and different uh, races um, and, and um, backgrounds. Um, I think diversity is important uh, because when you collaborate with individuals that see things differently than you do, um, it uh, fosters innovation, creation, um, and all of those positive things. So that's what I took up all my time, and he didn't get a chance to <laughs> respond. To Fantastic. Does anyone want to add to that? I, I, won't, I won't force it. I won't force it. Um, but that's a great start, and I think you know it really hits on you know one of the arguments that you often hear about why diversity is important. And there are many kind of arguments that people make that fall into different categories, whether it's related to morality or demographics and workforce needs or social justice issues. But I think what you hit on really is that diversity is actually important and critical to the quality of STEM. And that's really where I want to hone in on today. You know, if I had two hours to talk to you, I'd go through all of these arguments and there is deep evidence for each one of them. Um, but what we do find is that there is across many disciplines illustrations of how within sociology, psychology, economics, education, team science, career development, and leadership type studies and other fields, that diversity of groups leads to better outcomes than more homogeneous groups in general. And what, we are look, what their researchers are looking at when they're talking about diversity are the individual characteristics of people in that group and they make up the diversity of the group, whether it's demographic characteristics, um, racial or ethnic background, skills, um, socioeconomic background, disabilities or ability statuses. All of these things contribute to the diversity of groups. And when we put together the right type of diversity in a group, you see them functioning better. You see better decision making. You see better, more learning. And you see better outcomes actually in STEM disciplines. And so what this brings us to is a statement I think that's really critical. Not only is STEM important for outcomes, I mean diversity important for STEM outcomes, but what diversity actually is, it's diversity amongst a group. An individual is not diverse. Or as my colleague and friend Kenny Gibbs from NIH often puts it, I am not diverse. And the statement works better for him. Um, obviously, I am not diverse, um, <laughs> but you know I, what's really important is that when you take that perspective, really what you come to understand is that when you're pulling together groups and trying to understand who can contribute to STEM disciplines, it's not necessarily uh, their individual knowledge and abilities that are inherent within them or what they've learned over time but it's how they fit within the larger context with what they're, that they're entering, what they bring in terms of their problem-solving skills in contrast to the general makeup of that group, the heuristics of those groups, individuals that are already in the group. So if we take that logic and also if we just believe the fact potentially that grades IQ scores, SAT scores, are good perform indicators of academic performance. We also need to understand that individuals' ability to contribute to an academic uh, environment 
to a problem-solving group is actually not only dependent on those types of skills, but potentially more dependent on what they are bringing in terms of their individual identity diversity in terms of the rest of the group and what they're adding related to problem solving, perspectives, abilities, and backgrounds. And so what we end up with is that diversity, like you were saying, is the characteristics of a group and what individuals bring to it. Thus, I could be part of a diverse group and I could add to the diversity of the group, but it's dependent on who is already part of that group. And a really good, I think, example of and write-up of this work is in uh, Scott Page's book, The Diversity Bonus. Have folks here read this before? It's a fantastic book, and I think folks should really take a look. You know, he points out that diversity isn't magic. It's not that you just pull together people who are different in various ways. You actually need to be strategic about diversity. You need to think about what are the problems you're trying to solve? What is the scientific question at hand or the engineering um, uh, task that you're trying to perform? And based on that, you want to identify the cognitive skills, the backgrounds, the perspectives that would actually add to the richness of the thought being contributed. And even that alone is not enough. We can't just put well thought about and well designed diverse groups together and expect them to succeed. If they're not in an environment that actually promotes diversity, that values individuals' contributions regardless of who they are and where they're from. So we need to create inclusive environments to actually realize the bonus that you gain from diversity. And this is really why it's not magic. It takes thinking, it takes skill. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to create are environments where diversity facilitates friction, that enhances deliberation, and upends conformity. And usually these four factors are what you'll see in those types of groups when they're put together well, and when you're in an environment that supports inclusivity and diversity. And that's what we have been trying to think about within higher education. And the higher education research actually points to specific enhancements in learning where in environments where you have more diversity. So you end up with more complex thinking, more engagement and motivation, better learning and academic skills. You actually end up with more engagement in citizenship activity and more uh, uh, connections between individuals of diverse groups outside of classrooms. You end up with more creativity in these groups and better decision making and problem solving. All things that we want to see in our graduates and our STEM professionals, both hard and soft skills. <coughs> and it's not just research uh, that has shown this, and I'll get into some kind of practical applications of this work later um, as we explore the equality charters. Um, and so the question is, how do we actually create educational environments that support diversity, that have diverse groups participating in STEM classes, and where these environments actually support those diverse groups? And it's important to think about this because, like I said, you know, one of the things I wanted to say to you is that you know, we all know that we've been thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion for decades. This isn't a new issue. And we've been running programs at the federal level that are programs that are privately funded for many, many years. But we haven't seen the outcomes that we want to see on a national scale. We still have a great level of disparities across representation in STEM fields. We all know that white men are overrepresented, that women, people of, from minority groups are underrepresented. And this is in spite of the fact that we have been doing interventions for decades. And we've seen changes in some fields, but we know that we still aren't hitting the mark. And we are consistently able to sustain those changes. You know, I think one of the really interesting uh, case studies is the computer science field, where we've seen at some point, you know, more and more women going to those fields and then a drastic drop off. 
And, you know, I'd argue that the reason for this lack of sustained change is that we haven't changed the system. And we know also that these environments are not only abrasive to women, people of different backgrounds, but that at that intersection, it's even more difficult for women of color. And in, this, in a really seminal study back in 1976, Dr. Malcolm and her colleagues described the types of environments and experiences that women of color um, encounter in STEM education, STEM fields, and kind of what pushed them away from STEM. And this, sadly, many of the experiences that they describe in this report are still germane today and still occur. And part of the reason is, is that we've been taking sort of a piecemeal approach. We've been thinking about doing intervention programs, which we have a theory that will identify programs that work well in certain settings, will then scale them up more broadly in that setting, expand them to other universities, and that eventually they'll trickle up to create system change and be institutionalized, and those values will be internalized by all people within the system. But who here has run an education program before, been part of some of these intervention programs before? So one thing I think everyone who's run these programs before knows is that they're based on soft money. We give out funds to grantees usually for three to five years. And we have programs that are run by individuals who are passionate about these issues, who oftentimes are volunteering a lot of their work not getting credit professionally in the same way they do for their research and for other endeavors. And so these efforts, once the money dries up, they go away, the people go away, and then again, the institution hasn't kind of institutionalized or brought in those values and those changes that these programs have pushed in a way that is sustainable. So we see the individuals who are participating in these programs actually impacted. And we see good outcomes in programs that are mentorship programs, in bridge programs, in scholarship programs for individuals. But these programs don't reach enough people and don't change the system enough to where we realize long-standing and systemic change. And on top of that, you know, the field of education research, of institutional change, of STEM education, is coming to realize that this idea of relying solely on programmatic change is faulty. Because why are we creating interventions to change the status quo or to help the majority of people thrive in the status quo? Shouldn't the status quo actually be supportive of the majority of people? Why are we fixing people rather than the system? If the majority of folks find these cultures, these systems, these climates abrasive and difficult, why do we need to provide them supports and steal them against those environments? We should be thinking instead about how do we change those environments and systems to actually be supportive and more productive for everyone. And that's not to say that we shouldn't have intervention programs. We need to continue to have intervention programs while we change systems, because they don't change overnight. We need to ensure that we're always providing supports. But if we change institutions and climates and cultures, these programs will be more successful. They'll be part of an environment where what they're trying to accomplish is actually valued by the institution, by the system. And this is something that not only AAAS has come to as a potential solution in changing the balance of how much we focus on individual programs versus systemic change. It's also come up more and more throughout the decade in consensus reports, in research in STEM fields, in research and in institutional change. These are just a few of the studies. One is one that I was lucky enough to work on with Dr. Malcolm, the barriers and opportunities to two and four year STEM degrees. But you'll see even in their titles, even in their titles, there are the words, you know, systemic change, culture change, climate, culture, and consequences. And in fact, the project that I'm able to work on, Sea Change, was highlighted in the recent harassment report by the academies. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, it's interesting that it's in there. Also, there is a role for federal agencies called out in there. I think if you're organization has not looked at it yet, 
would at least start an interesting conversation. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that report as well. So when we started thinking about, given where we are in diversity and DEI and STEM and higher ed, how can we actually affect systemic change? And so, you know, we were really excited to be able to be cited within the Academy's report. And it's not often that that happens. You know, the Academy's reports require that programs actually have evidence of their impact and show promise. And the reason we were cited is because we are developing this sea change project based on the Equalities Charter, which has shown great evidence. And we learned about this actually about four years ago. Um, a few faculty members and leaders within STEM who had done sabbaticals in the UK came back excited about the work that they had seen and the impact they had seen in the UK um, through the institutions that had gone through the equality charters process. And so what I want to do is kind of walk you through a little bit of what they shared with us about this process. And by show of hands, who here has heard of Athena Swan or the equity charters process? All right. Um, so what they came to tell us about is about um, back in 2005, the UK established what they called Athena Swan, which was a gender equity focused program to push systemic change. It worked so well that they actually started up a race equality charter process when they re realized in the UK that race and ethnicity also became uh, barriers to success uh, within STEM. Um, and it started to expand to other countries. Uh, you see here the SAGE program in Australia is one example. In uh, Canada, they, they just started up the Dimensions program. Um, in Ireland, they have a similar program. And there are other countries, including the US, that are looking to adopt this model. And it's not just the fact that it's spread and grown over time that illustrates its effectiveness. But before we get into the impact it's had, let me tell you a little bit about what it actually is. <coughs> So what the Equality Charters allows institutions to do is to stand up and say that they are willing to adhere to a set of principles related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that they're willing to go through the charter process that includes a deep, robust self-assessment. And if they do pass that self-assessment, they are able to receive an award based on where they are in supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion at their institution. So this assessment really includes um, an individualized approach to understanding what's working and what's not working at an institution, identifying root causes, and then putting together a strategic plan that will allow you to address those root causes over time and track your progress. And then built into this is kind of a continuous improvement model. So. The first time institutions go through this self-assessment process, they're able to receive a bronze award if their analysis and, and five-year, four-year plan is seen as impactful and effective. Then what the departments get to start doing is the hard work of making change, doing what they put forth in their four-year plans. And afterwards, they can come back and renew or upgrade to a higher level award based on whether or not they made the progress that they were expecting to see. Also at this time, institutions are able to allow their departments to apply for similar awards, which, cause, which basically causes a top-down, bottom-up uh, push for change. And this is important because you know, at the institutional level and the departmental level, there are different types of, uh, kind of a different locus of control that the institutions have and departments have. So they can make different types of changes and affect different systems within an institution. So this top-down, bottom-up is really, really important. And overall, what this program, this framework, really is all about is about a commitment to removing barriers. It's not about hiring one more person from an underrepresented background. It's about taking more of a targeted approach to issues um, and looking at both internal and external factors that are impacting the climate for STEM at the institutions. And it's about implementing good practice and being transparent, being open and honest. It's about changing systems, not fixing students. 
And we know this has really worked well within the UK. Um, in 2017, actually 96 institutions received awards or were holding awards at that time, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the UK only has 130 uh, institutions of higher education. Um, and about 20 more of those institutions actually tried to get awards, but didn't receive them. Again, this isn't just a check, check the box type of exercise. You need to do the hard work. And even amongst those institutions, there were nearly 600 departments that had also received awards. So it's really spread across all of the UK. And the high level benefits that they promised and are actually seeing relate to making positive changes or highlighting, institutions can highlight the positive changes that they're making. It encourages more transparency. It allows institutions to demonstrate to people who are interested in finding a new job that they're actually a welcoming environment and they're working on these issues. And it's also flexible enough that institutions can hone in on the issues that are particular to their context, the size of their institution, and the people that they're serving there. And over time, they've done two different evaluations of the program and found that nearly everyone who's involved at the universities who receive awards see just going through this process as impactful to the environment and to the work that they're doing. I'll do that up there in, a sec. in addition, they're finding that sustainable change is actually occurring. Women are more uh, visible within the institution. They have increased self-confidence and enhanced leadership skills. All staff are describing more positive differences in career satisfaction and availability of more development opportunities. In addition, the administrative and technical staff actually are reporting greater sense of belonging as well. So there are impacts across all of the institution from the top to the bottom. This work is mostly focused on uh, staff and faculty. Um, you'll see when we get to sea change, we're talking, we focus a bit more on the student population. But it's also in the UK changing who's participating in STEM not only as faculty, but as leaders um, in departments where they have an institutional or a departmental level award, they have 7% more female faculty. They have more balanced senior level management. They have more women in the pool of the shortlisted individuals for job openings. And they have more female appoint appointments um, to their staff as well. So it's changing who's participating, and the makeup of the leadership and the faculty. And over time, you know, institutions are able to move not only from the bronze to the silver to the gold awards. The first one they gave out in, I think, 14 years into the program it took for an institution to get a gold award, which signifies that they are a beacon for diversity, equity, and inclusion within the country. And that means they're helping other institutions actually be more inclusive, be more diverse. And so that's not only impacting the education, it's impacting the research they're doing, where they're receiving more funds and they're getting better outcomes from their research. And it's not just the evaluations that are showing these impacts. In the UK, they do something similar to the NSF, Science and Engineering Indicators. And a national survey actually showed that having an Athena Swan Award was the most critical factor that women um, considered when seeking a new appointment or a job somewhere else. And so when our colleagues came to us at, at AAAS and talked to us about these issues and explained how impactful the Athena Swan project had been, how the equality charters had really moved the needle in the, in the country, we were super excited. And we thought to ourselves, how can we stand up something similar in the US? And I really do mean we. You know, the sea change is managed by and led by Dr. Shirley Malcolm. Um, my colleagues include Beth Rudy, Darla Thompson, um, and Aaron Kahn. Um, and as you can see, we're a pretty diverse group. We even include me, so that's great. Um, and so we've been thinking hard about how do we do what they've done in the UK? How do we change the narrative and stay the course of promoting systemic change, of working to fix the system, 
and really helping institutions explore how they can make change in their own context, while also thinking about you know, making this something that is voluntary, that allows institutions to stand up and say, we care about this, we want to make change, we want to be good stewards and something that forces them to disaggregate data so we can see some of those intersectional issues. So when we looked at the U.S., we thought we probably need to do something slightly different. Um, the U.S. system is much larger. We have nearly 4,000 higher education institutions, both public and private, for-profit and non-profit across many different uh, regions that have different certification processes. And we need to be kind of sensitive to that scale and difference as we were putting this together. In addition, I don't know if you guys know, we are a much more litigious society. <laughs> and we have laws that govern and federal regulations and state regulations that govern what we can do in related to DEI, what we can do in education. Um, we have, like I said, different types of institutions and legal considerations that need to be uh, really deeply embedded into this process because more and more we see high profile lawsuits about you know equity and inclusion and we see issues related to sharing data where institutions are would be scared to share the level of data that we're asking them to analyze because they might be FOIA'd and what they found you know we're asking them to share with us their most unflattering data and findings because we want them to be honest about where they're struggling and to be able to put together plans that honestly address those struggles. So we need to think about FOIA. Um, one nice thing that we have in our back pocket is AAAS has, you know, even a decade ago, pulled together a report on the intersection of diversity and the law in higher education that lays out, in a very legalese way, um, what can and can't be done, what sort of programs and projects and policies are actually legally sustainable. So in considering all that, what we did was we created Sea change And Sea change is more than just um, an award system. It also includes an institute and a community. So similar to what goes on in the UK, institutions can now apply for a Sea change award, and it's based on a similar type of assessment, and they can receive higher level awards over time based on the progress they make. But we're also providing a Sea Change Institute where different education, different folks within Sea Change colleges and universities can come and learn about best practices, hear about cutting edge work in climate change within institutions, can talk about how you actually uh, run good programs, change policies, and create systemic change. And we're also hosting a community where institutions can come together with their peers to talk in a safe space about these changes and also connect with other funders and stakeholders in the field. So what we're starting with is next year we are launching our initial membership phase. And membership will include the availability to take advantage of the award system, the community, and the institute. <coughs> And to become members, we're asking our institutions to stand up and say they will adhere to a set of principles related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have kind of the primary one listed here. You can find the other ones on our website. Um, and along with asking them to stand up and say they'll adhere to these principles, you know, we are asking them to pay a membership fee because we want this to be sustainable. And our sustainability plan includes membership fees, as well as sponsorships from different foundations and industry partners. At first, you know, the fees will be about half as much as they will be when we get to full launch in 2021, because a lot of our resources aren't fully developed yet. And so you know, we're taking that in consideration. In addition, we are just piloting the second round of awards. We made a ton of changes to the award process based on the first pilot. Let me give you a sense though of where we are. Similar to the UK, we're doing a top-down, bottom-up approach. But our institutional awards not only include asking uh, our universities to collect data on faculty, but also to look at the student environment for undergrads and grads. At the same time, we have similar awards available to departments. And there we have kind of a 
more even focus on faculty and students. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, you know, we have a ton more institutions. There are 2,000 or so non or four-year and two-year uh, institutions that are public. To be able to actually scale to support all of the departments that are STEM-related in those universities, we're working with uh, different <clears throat> disciplinary societies to actually create and augment the application process to be more specific to the disciplines, where it's calling out the issues that are particular to those disciplines and asking them not only to create those applications, but actually manage the application process so that we don't have to figure out how to deal with the 10 to 15,000 different STEM departments across the US. And we have a similar kind of phasing of the awards. And you'll see, overall, what we're trying to be is a program that is open and accessible to all universities. So to get a bronze level award, you can be at different starting levels. You don't have to already be making changes into related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. You just have to be able to do an honest assessment of whether you're good, bad, or somewhere in between and put together a plan that actually includes meaningful change. It's when we get to the silver awards where we're actually pushing for and we want institutions to show those changes. And then eventually, you know, our goal is that everyone would be a bronze, excuse me, a gold awardee, but we know that it takes time. <coughs> so really the process includes awareness, generating understanding, developing actions, and reflecting on whether those actions get us to where we want to be, and then repeating. And what we're asking institutions to collect information on is how they'll support this process, how they'll engage in the process, we're asking them to do deep analysis from every, on everything from their institutional composition to their institutional climate and develop that action plan based on their findings. So all these action plans will be different and reviewed by a peer review panel. And this work is, uh, it's a heavy lift. We've heard from our first round, our first cohort of awardees that it takes time in fact, we advise our institutions to expect this will take at least 12 months. At the same time, we know that we're not the only ones out there in higher education pushing for institutional change. There are other programs like the Aspire Network that is working to make changes related to the faculty makeup in STEM. There is the I3 uh, work by, funded by HHMI that is looking at changing the student body. And then there are advanced grants through NSF that are really looking to make, make higher education a more inclusive place for women. And so what we've done is we've looked at all these programs and we've constructed our application in a way that institutions can take what they've learned from participating in those programs and just drop it into the application to hopefully alleviate some of the burden in putting this together. And so, like I said, we did pilot the awards. And last year, we, we announced our three uh, award winners uh, who were U University of California, Davis, the University of Massachusetts, Lowell, and the University of Boston. We're currently running our second cohort. Um, and those awardees will be submitting their final applications by October of this year. And the awards announcements will be made in December or January um, coming up. And like I said in the beginning, we do have these other parts that are meant to help institutions get through the application process. And we're providing uh, support and advice as institutions progress through their uh, work over the year that they're working on it. We're developing trainings. We're putting together a research repository. And we're hoping to be able to start hosting, moderating conversations, and support learning communities. <coughs> Now the first two areas we're going to dig into in our institution are related to the talking about leaving revisited, which is a look back at a report from 30 years ago that was the first of its kind to assess why people leave STEM at different places in the, pop, in the pipeline. And later, I think in two months, or the new uh, volume will be released. 
and we'll be putting together a training based on interviews with the authors, editors, and the researchers cited in that report to illustrate what, what was learned and how those learnings can be applied and what they mean for DEI and STEM higher education. In addition, later this year, well, later next year, uh, we'll be rolling out a revision to our diversity and the law handbook. And we'll be translating the handbook from legalese to a language that we can all understand, um, highlighting the implications of that and how to build legally sustainable programs and policies. And we're really excited to be able to roll that out and provide guidance uh, midway through next year. We've also done a needs assessment with the field to identify other areas where we'll be kind of highlighting first. Um, and so there'll be more and more work coming together that institutions can avail themselves of. And so what we're kind of promoting as the tangible and intangible goals of the program and what we're hoping to see, you know, range everywhere from helping institutions declare that they value DEI and they're willing to put a stake in the ground and say this is what we're about and we're going to make positive change. All the way down to what we're doing within the Institute, providing guided investigations of policies in light of the law, and helping individual institutions understand how within their context they can build better and more sustainable programs. And so, you know, this has a lot of implications, but none of this work really would be uh, able to occur without our funders. You know, I want to thank NSF, who's in the room, um, who's one of our funders through the advance grant. Um, we also have funding through NIH, um, and through a bunch of family foundations, and through an individual as well. Um, in the long run, like I said, our sustainability plan is to work through and be supported by membership dues. So what does this all mean? And so we've got, you know, about 15 minutes left. Um, and you know what I wanted to think about with you is how does ONR, NSF, DOD, other federal agencies support systemic change? Maybe not particularly the sea change project, but how can it other places actually drive systemic change? And this really requires some creative thinking. You know, for example, folks have started to talk about whether or not within NSF's broader impacts, there can be a call out for whether or not uh, money can be spent on supporting systemic change, on doing climate surveys or implementing the findings of climate surveys. Some actual advanced grantees have started to build in membership dues for sea change into their advanced grant applications. There are, in the UK, there's actually the equivalent to the NIH which has said that you can't apply for research funding unless you have a silver level Athena Swan Award. Now, we know that's a high bar and difficult in the US given the politicization of anything uh, of that nature. But there are other ways to think about supporting diversity, inclusion, equity at a systemic level. You know, could it be a priority in grants? Could you get, you know, bonus points for doing climate surveys for actually having a diversity plan. There are different ways also to, to support sea change in particular. Um, some institutions, some agencies have talked about supporting the rollout and development and maintenance of the departmental level awards for the disciplines that they're most attached to. Others have talked about actually supporting individual institutions as they pull together their awards by providing them seed funding to buy out the time of faculty to work on putting together this deep analysis, to writing a five-year plan, and then to actually track it over time. So there are really different ways. Um, and so those are the types of kind of creative things we're hearing from the field and things I'd love to kind of push you to think about. And so what I'd like to do is kind of just turn this back over to you all give you two or three minutes just to turn to your colleague again, reflect on what you've heard, and think about whether there is something that you think your organization or other organizations could be doing to support this type of systemic change. So one of the things that uh, I had discussed earlier with uh, the awards people and with legal here was, you know, NSF and NIH do require in their awards language if, um, charges of 
uh, harassment or bullying by the performers at the universities are made, we're made aware of it. There wasn't anything explicit in the, hey, we're going to yank your funding back, but clearly just putting the messaging in there that we're, this is something we're monitoring and we want to know and we do reserve the right to pull the funding back um, would seem to be a way to emphasize that kind of harassment behavior or, you know, and then move it into should they at least be collecting information uh, and those are the things we could require in yeah. the awards language. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, uh, one of our award-winning institutions, they uh, have a similar policy where all applicants for new jobs need to disclose whether or not they have an action pending against them or have had an action against them related to harassment in the past. And they don't say what, that doesn't disqualify them from having or being uh, getting the uh, job. But what it, they found is it discourages people who have those actions pending in the past or have had those actions against them. And so you might find that you know, it does start to incentivize institutions to think clearly about and closely about who are the faculty at their institutions and are they really supporting the best STEM possible, which we know requires diverse people to be part of that um, endeavor. Anyone else? In the back. One of the topics that uh, we, Ryan and I discussed, my colleague Ryan um, and I discussed, was how um, you had mentioned that there is a pipeline and that diversity is pretty good as you're coming out of high school, but you're doing an analysis on the other end where it seems to have a drop off. Is there, uh, are there groups that are looking at that sort of valley of death between the high school age versus uh, higher education? And uh, how does this program uh, facilitate that? Yeah, so, you know, uh, you know, the transition from high school to college is a place where we see a lot of drop off of uh, folks who say they intend or are interested in a STEM degree and actually who then eventually registers for a STEM degree. And there's data that, you know, the, that hasn't changed over the decades and that a lot of the reasons that why people are leaving those disciplines or not applying is because, well, one, you know, the initial math classes that they enter are oftentimes not set up in a way to actually support them where they are and build them up. There are differential types of um, grading scales and kind of uh, cutoffs and what, were, what are expected of first year students in STEM areas versus non-STEM areas. We actually have STEM for dummies and STEM for majors in a lot of places. And so people start to see that and think of themselves as someone who isn't good at STEM because of those types of barriers and structures and culture that are in place. The way that systems change, C change in specific is addressing that, is by calling out those changes, asking institutions to look, excuse me, calling out those issues, asking institutions to look at, well, why aren't more people who say when they're coming into our university, who say they're interested in STEM, actually majoring in it? Is that the case? What are they running into? Can we identify the issues? Are we talking to the students about that? Do we know whether or not we're following best practice already? And then they can develop a plan that says we're going to address those issues because that's the issue that we care about most right now. And so that's the way sea change kind of helps institutions make those changes. Um, but it doesn't really require that they make that change. What it requires is they do kind of a broad assessment to understand whether they have that issue and whether that issue is a high enough priority for them to address. I actually have two questions and, and a statement, yeah. um, only because it's really important to me and I've read your background. Uh, my bachelor's is in social psychology and I'm a class and a capstone away from my master's in organizational development. Um, and I just recently just kind of went over diversity and inclusion, uh, which caused me, my statement is that I did the, are you familiar with the GDIB, the Global Diversity and Inclusion Benchmark? Ah. So um, it's an assessment tool um, that I actually done for ONR. 
um, and quite interesting. So kind of to answer your question, did we kind of look at it? Yeah. I did just for my academic studies. Uh, but my question to you is, um, in your opinion, where in the developmental stage do you believe DEI should begin? Because as a graduate level or undergraduate, it's kind of we're addressing the symptom yeah. and not the illness. And I believe the illness is more of in a developmental stage. Yeah, I, I, listen, I, diversity, equity, inclusion is a problem throughout our education system. Because our education system is a reflection of our culture at large, where DEI is problematic. Um, you know, we don't find uh, that there are rich and meaningful conversations about diversity and equity within our culture in general. So, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise that there are issues in K-12 where, you know, you still hear people say that, you know, men are better at math than women, which actually the research shows the opposite, but you know, and that there are these kind of gender stereotypes that we all fall into um, that have been pervasive throughout our society since its existence. Um, and so we need to be addressing these issues throughout the pipeline, um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, addressing them in K-12 is more important than higher education or the workforce. We need to be working on these things all in concert, or we're going to drop the ball somewhere, and we're going to fail the people that are really interesting, interested in STEM and who can contribute the most to the endeavor. Thank you, and that brings me to my last question, is um, regarding the Athena Swan, mm -hmm. how many of the HBCUs do you see even interested, let alone participating? Yeah. So the Athena they Swan is the UK version of the program. They don't have HBCUs in the UK. Um, and they just, well, it was funny, basically they didn't have a race-focused equality program because they thought that race wasn't a problem within the UK. And then they did a survey of their faculty and I can't do a British accent, so I won't even try, but they're like, oh yeah, it's a problem for us. We feel excluded, we feel marginalized, and, but you guys never asked, and we're British, and we're polite, so we didn't want to raise our voice. Uh, it's basically what they found. And so, you know, they started up the race equality charter there now, which is looking more at the, the issues that people with, from different backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities are facing. Um, but within the US, this program is designed to also serve HBCUs and minority serving institutions. We have one institution, uh, we, haven't, we kind of keep the institution's names private who are going through the application process. There is one HBCU that's going through the process. And you know, it's interesting because a lot of our HBCUs and MSIs are really the, the standouts in producing um, STEM graduates from underrepresented backgrounds. And they have created a culture that is welcoming to all, basically because their leadership's diverse and their charter is diverse, and that's what they're about. But they do have problems, issues that they're identifying as they go through this, whether it's the diversity of the faculty, the leadership, whether it's where they're recruiting and retaining students in different disciplines, they have found issues. And so we do think this can be beneficial for MSIs, and we honestly think that our MSIs can move through the process somewhat quicker than the general uh, higher education sector. Um, so, um, what are the overall questions here? We, we've been toying around with using uh, analytics to, to kind of look at ourselves in terms of diversity, mm -hmm. both in uh, our, our workforce as well as our PIs. Uh, it's a big thing. One of the big uh, hindrances, I think, when it comes to especially looking at our PIs is, is that uh, we're not able to ask in NSF Fastlane or things like that, huh. you know, questions about um, ethnicity, gender, and things like that. I'm not quite sure if that's a legal reason or if that's just NSF, or I'm not sure if the root, root cause of that, mm -hmm. how much that's been law or not. Just that we don't, Brian, we don't currently. For grants, we modified the cover page <coughs> at the beginning of FY18, and we do ask, so there's an 
addendum to the cover page, and it asks gender, ethnicity, and citizenship, but it's optional, and we are not doing anything with those data to date. We have the data, we don't really have them organized. Yeah, but even that, I mean, we, I'd be curious, yeah. as a best practice, when you ask for voluntary submission, I think you tend to get a bias in the data. People yes. who care will submit that they, you know, mm -hmm. hey, we care, but people who don't care are like, ah, I'm not gonna fill that because it's gonna make, make me look bad. Yeah. Um, so I'd be curious about that in general, but even as for our initial analytics we're showing, you know, I, I guess when you see people do the analytics, um, what do you, have you seen as best practices? Like for instance, if we see changes, if we, like for instance, some of this without pointing fingers, we definitely saw disparity in codes. Some codes had a much higher amount of PIs that were female mm -hmm. than other codes. Um, there were dramatic differences yeah. um, between codes. Um, and we also saw differences uh, within PIs. Some PIs, did, when they report to their grad students and stuff like that, didn't have a lot of diversity as well. Yeah. So one is how, what are best practices you've seen at places like NSF, NH, and places like that, for how you hold the program officer type people accountable for their portfolio? Mm -hmm. and the other question is, how do you see us hold, what are some of the best practices for, for holding PIs responsible for their own workforce on that? Yeah. And then so, how do you measure that? Is that a, a so just a small question. Small question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think in some of the things that NSF, NIH, other uh, federal agencies do well is they do the hard work to actually help ensure that they're receiving um, applications from a diverse sector. They go out and provide supports to HBCUs, MSIs who haven't traditionally been grantees, and provide them with the support to know what does it take to actually put together a good proposal. They, they, and they have strong connections and build trust over the years with those institutions so that then they start receiving more of those applications from more of those types of institutions. And so I think that's really important. They do work with um, you know, more uh, junior level faculty to help them also apply because you know, our senior level faculty are whiter and more male than our junior level faculty. And so there are restrictions on what data you can collect, but you can ensure a more diverse pool if you do some of that hard work up front. Two, in terms of collecting data, you know, there are legal restrictions. I'm not familiar with all of them. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> what we've seen as an effective way to collect the data is to, like you're saying, actually have those questions on the application, but tell them those aren't things that are shared with the peer reviewers. And aren't taken to skip and aren't used to make decisions, but what they are used for is to understand who is receiving these grants afterwards, so that you can potentially make changes to the process of applying, the outreach that you're doing to improve the applicant pool and maybe change that over time. One comment about how we're different than that because we don't have to. One second, here. Ryan. Mm -hmm. so, so, one second, Ryan. It's being recorded. I think, yeah, one thing that's, that's worth noting here at O&R, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have peer review on the selection yeah. process. So as, as, as my earlier kind of question of how do you yeah. <clears throat> hold directly responsible program officers since they don't have yeah. the peer review issue? I mean, there's it, a little... Well, it's, a, 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 it's a little wrinkle we have the NIH yeah. and NSF. Don't well, and peer review isn't, um, you know, going to solve all your problems. If you look at the at review of NIH that they did a few years ago in the study, the Ginther study that came out, they basically showed that they were supporting the same kind of people and the same kind of researchers because what they, um, who they were recruiting to be reviewers were all people who had received PI, uh, were PIs in the past, and also the things that they valued in their scoring were skewed towards what the white um, kind of male uh, biomedical scientists were most interested in. They were less, they were putting less value to like community health studies, studies related, and other studies related to issues that are, you know, more germane and more interest and uh, to diverse populations. And so, you know, the peer review process won't solve all your problems, but I think there are lessons learned about, you know, collecting that data, but then keeping it, um, 
hidden when you're making those decisions because we all have biases. Even it's an individual program officer about, you know, when we even read a name and we know that person's female, it changes how we interpret what's in that application. And so we need to think carefully about what we're actually showing to individuals who are reviewing it. We need to think carefully about whether people have gone through a bias training in, in recently, whether they understand the, their own biases um, so that you know, we're less likely to make decisions that are based on those biases. Um, but there really isn't um, you know, a one kind of silver bullet to make the process more equitable um, but what it really does take is a deep look, like you're saying, at what's going on across ONR and how you can potentially work together to put checks and balances in place. Is there one more question? Sandra? Well, since you're on that topic and you've got it's my turn to represent <laughs> the microphone. Thank you. Since you, you kind of opened the, the door mm -hmm. for that, for the question, is you, you said, you know, once we look at the data and and take that inward look mm -hmm. and see how we're doing, to you know implement some changes, what what might some of those be yeah. for O and R? Definitely, yeah. I mean, so a lot of the things that we're like pointing to um, in terms of best practice are doing, uh, requiring bias trainings, requiring. Um, all of our reviewers or PIs that are reviewing, or folks that are reviewing grants, PIs that are receiving grants, to sign an agreement that they will be good stewards, will not be harassers, and be able to actually take away those awards, those responsibilities, if they violate anything in those contracts. We're asking institutions to actually put the needed trainings in place, like I said. We're asking the folks who are giving out grants to think about what you can incentivize from your grantees based on you know what's in the application whether it's saying that you need to have you, you ask them if they have a diversity plan or not you might not give them points towards the award but it at least raises the issue with them and you might ask yourself internally like, do we have a diversity plan do I know what that is what does it look like how is it being implemented? What impact has it have, had? Are we making the changes that we wanted to make? And to continually come back to this issue. Um, one of the other things that we're pushing all of our grantees to have is have a lead on diversity, equity, inclusion, and actually give them some power and some money to be able to do the work. Um, to make sure that we're not just asking women and people of color to do this work. Because oftentimes it's kind of the hidden workload that women and people of color are asked to do that they don't ever get credit for and pulls them away from their scholarship that often leads to promotion, tenure, along the way. And so these are the kind of the things that we really are pushing um, institutions, agencies to think about. All right, let's thank Dr. Federer.